question mean exactly? That's a dividing question because it's a word that people often will interpret to work with their own doctrine on the subject. So, excuse me, the, the chosen Charlies will interpret it with a fatalistic or deterministic kind of definition. Whereas the free will Freddies tend to interpret it in a foreseeing but non-interfering kind of a way. Now, the problem with predestination as a word is that it's, it's really mainly a, a theological word. So when free will is debated in secular philosophy, it's pitted against predeterminism. So predestination is really reserved for the Christian world to interpret it to fit whatever definition really fits their model. It's one of those things, it's hard to prove exactly what it means with other literature. We just sort of end up making our own definition in many ways. It's a compound word, which essentially means it's one word formed of two components. You've got pre, meaning before or in front of, and destination, meaning the place where you're going, which marks the end of, of the journey. As if to say you've reached the end of the journey or the plan for your journey beforehand. And you could really look at that in two ways. Either number one, that you've already reached your destination before you've reached your destination. You know, a bit like how we've got eternal life, even though we're not yet in eternal life, if that makes sense. Or number two, that your destination has already been mapped out for you. You're not striving on a journey, hoping that you might make it eventually. Rather, you're on a journey because you've already been told where you're going. You already know where you're going. You're sure that you're going to get there. So you just get on with it because you want to get there. But it's already been mapped out for you. It's very eternally minded language. Almost as if to say, you already have eternal life and a glorified body before you actually have it. As if the things that you have been promised were already received. And there are some scriptures that read like this, verses which talk about things which have been done from or before the foundation of the world, or things done in heavenly places that are just not yet manifest in our consignment to time. And in Ephesians particularly, we see the subject being somewhat interchangeable with election and foreknowledge, again, which are also things from the foundation of the world. So Ephesians chapter one, we're introduced to the concept by stating in verse 3 that God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, a carnal mind might assume that this doesn't apply yet because we're here on the earth, time is ticking, and we're waiting and waiting for our entry into, into heavenly places. And yet it says that God has already blessed you with these blessings. It's in the past tense. It's already happened. You've already been blessed. And these blessings are according as God has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. Now that that verse could be an entire sermon on its own really, but notice that the we and the us, God has blessed us in heavenly places according to a choice he has made before the foundation of the world. We should be holy and without blame because of an eternal foreordained plan that God has made, not because of our own works or behaviour modification or things that we're trying to do on this earth to, to bring those things about. Because as John explains, being the children of God, it's, it's according to the will of God, not the will of man. Having already blessed us and already chosen us before the world was ever created, before Adam and Eve sinned, before you had any concept that you even exist or no good and evil, we were predestined onto the adoption of children. So you might say that our destiny or destination is our spiritual adoption and it's according to the pleasure of his goodwill. Now I don't know how adoption works or if it's different in various countries or if it's anything like it's portrayed in movies or films or what it was like in Paul's time but typically it's portrayed that prospect prospective parents will be given profiles of adoptable children so they can consider whether they would be more suited to a boy or a girl or groups of siblings or whatever the criteria might be. And of course, God, already foreknowing all things, has already picked the profiles and, and made his choice. Now, some people might say that that explanation so far doesn't imply that predestination is somehow antithetical to free will, 
because God looked forward in time, saw who would believe, chose their profiles and he amounted them for adoption. But here's where it gets a little bit messy from that point of view, is that Paul starts giving reasons for the good pleasure of his will. So as maybe it's someone's good pleasure to adopt a boy or a girl or siblings or a disabled child or an abused child because many Christians feel a divine calling to favour a child who's had a hard life and make it better. Well, God has a pleasure too, you might say. Well, you, you might say then to that, that, well, it's his pleasure to adopt those who believe. Well, perhaps. But Paul is going to make it even more messy for you, though, because he continues his reasoning into the next verse. That it's to the praise and of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted into the beloved. And this is where, as I've spoken about before in the series, God's criteria for election, because using that example of adoption I gave you, the parent's criteria for adoption is based on qualities of the child, that is, their flesh and blood. Are you the gender that I want? Do you have the right background? Do you come from a country that I specifically want to adopt from, like how people want to, I want to adopt a Chinese child or whatever, because of something about that particular country that means they want to have children from that country. Now, those things are generally involuntary. On, on the child's part there may be some voluntary criteria such as would you get on well with other siblings or whatever um, I'm not sure but God's criteria is based on grace his undeserved merited favor there were no good characteristics in the adoptee nothing in their flesh or their blood or, or even their will because it's God who has made us accepted into the beloved so the adoptees met the criteria for adoption because God has made them acceptable for the criteria of adoption. Why is that? Well, it doesn't just say his grace. It says to the praise and glory of his grace. So he chose a people for adoption, for his good pleasure, that his grace would be praised and glorified. Now, as I've spoken about previously in the series, the atheist or apologist who's trying to scientifically verify their way to God. Well, that's not to the praise and the glory of his grace. That's praising the glory of your evidence and science. Most Christians are trying to vindicate themselves by their changed lifestyle and surrender, but that's not to the praise and the glory of his grace. That's to the praise and the glory of your testimony. Okay. But to those of you who believe in salvation by grace without any yeah buts, grace is a big part of our Christian lingo, you know, among the free graces, easy believers, and we, we celebrate grace. We talk about it constantly. We even call our messy, divided, vague group of people free grace because it emphasizes the, the free gift of grace. And it really winds up our enemies, doesn't it? You know, look at these grace abusers. We love to talk about grace all the time, but not obedience. You don't know what grace means. How dare you say that grace is free with no works attached? Cheap grace, hyper grace. You just love your sins. But God's grace is not glorified by works because Paul already explained that grace is exclusionary to works. If it be by grace, it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace uh, and work is no more work. So God's grace is praised by us. We constantly talk about it. We name our doctrinal group after it. And it's glorified by God having a remnant that believes it and proclaims it grace is not glorified by man's works or man's wisdom or man's testimonies about himself because these things are a debt but grace is God's giving out of the free gift and so predestination is that before the foundation of the world before you had any concept of good and evil you already had a destiny God chose you because there was nothing good about you that deserved to have a destiny Therefore, you would glorify and praise God's grace and not your own filthy rags, which with so many Christians praise and glory instead, treating God's grace as more of an instrument to achieve their boastful self-justification. Now, free will Freddie might take what I've just said here and respond that, well, you haven't really said anything that's antithetical to free will because God foresaw those who will believe him and chose them and they knew that there's nothing good about themselves so they have an easier time believing than works boasters but we still praise and bring glory to his grace after all we call ourselves free grace and 
most free grace people are probably free will leaning. And I get what you're saying, absolutely. I think I just, I have reservations about invoking free will into the predestination idea. Mainly that in this detailed chapter of Ephesians 1, Paul doesn't really invoke free will into his discussion. Now, admittedly, also, he doesn't rebuke free will. He doesn't categorise free will as works, strictly speaking. He just doesn't suggest in any way that it has any bearing or relevance to the subject of predestination. And previously in the series, I have spoken about how, you know, I do reject the Calvinistic word salad of total depravity that man is so utterly depraved and has no choice to believe and blah, blah, blah. But what I would replace it with is this, that it is the blindness of man, that he's deceived by the devil. And you can't, you can't necessarily expect a, a blind man to choose a choice based on something that he cannot see, like matching colours, for instance. And I believe that my position is consistent with Ephesians 1 predestination, because Paul goes on to say, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, so you see, the, the will of God was a mystery until God made it known to us. We couldn't have known it because it was a mystery until he revealed it to us. And to most Christians, it's still a mystery. And that's why they get confused about the most basic things in the Bible. Like, you need to do the will of God to enter into the kingdom. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, faith without works is dead. But the Lord, Lord people pointed to their works not their faith. In Matthew 21, the publicans and harlots believed, and it said that they did the will of God entering into the kingdom. Or another thing they tend to come at us with is, well, Jesus should lose nothing, and no man shall pluck you out, and so on and so forth, but you can still walk away, though, you know, your free will. Well, unfortunately, that's not how shepherding works. Sheep don't just have the free will to wander off. That, that's not how it works at all. So they just get confused by the mystery of grace, even though to us it's so blatantly obvious, it seems strange to even call it a mystery, doesn't it? But this mystery is known, it's made known according to his good pleasure, that he has purposed in himself, not our good pleasure or our purpose, which isn't really, see, if you want to say that it's, it's all just through the lens of free will and you take the free will, Freddy's sort of view of Ephesians 1, my problem is, is that the way that Paul is phrasing all of this stuff in Ephesians 1 isn't really very helpful language if free will Freddy's position on it is true because we certainly find it of good pleasure to be saved by grace and not works that seems to work to our purposes very well but predestination is not according to our purposes it's according to his purposes and he works all things after the counsel of his own will which in layman's terms means he doesn't need our advice, he doesn't need our permission, he doesn't need our suggestions or our validation. Now that, again, as I've said before, this is not to say that we can't ask for others to be saved, because Jesus said, ask in my name, and he, he also explained how much your Heavenly Father wants to bless you, okay? It doesn't mean we can't ask, but we still have to under, understand the fundamentals of, of the reasons that Paul is actually giving here. Now the sentence continues that we should be to the praise and the glory of his grace and then paul says that repeatedly throughout this chapter who first trusted christ and as i've said before that the free will freddies take this verse and say well see there it is that is the causality we are chosen and predestined because we first trusted christ but again the problem that i have with that claim is that paul didn't write causality on our part into this verse he, he did not say because we first trusted christ rather he said we who first trusted Christ. So what Paul is essentially doing in that verse is explaining who we are. We who first trusted Christ, we are the identifiable people who were called, chosen, predestined to the praise and the glory of his grace. There are a lot of Christians, including my subscriber base, who think that their group are the special ones at the exclusion of everybody else, right? You know, the Catholics think that they are the chosen ones that Ephesians is talking about because they belong to the one holy apostolic church that Jesus Christ founded. But that's not how Paul identified the Ephesians. The Jehovah's Witnesses think that it's them because they belong to God's end times restorationist movement. Seventh-day Adventists also think this. But again, that's not the criteria that Paul gave for identifying who the elect are in Ephesians 1. 
the evangelicals think that it's about them because they turned from their sins and surrendered their lives. But again, that's not the criteria that Paul gives in Ephesians 1. The criteria that marks out who we are in Ephesians 1 is those that who first trusted Christ. That, that's the identifier for marking the elect among them, the non-elect. Not those who are baptised into the correct denomination, not those who turn their lives around and ask Jesus to wipe their slate clean, but then said, no, thanks, Jesus, I'll take it from here. Not those who surrendered their lives and gave up everything as, as though they had something to offer God for some reason. It's those who trusted Christ, those who believed on him. He is their saviour, he is their high priest, he's their mediator, their sin offering, and so on and so on. But everything about them points to Christ. Now, as I said, it, it's not specifically stated that that's the reason why they were predestined. It's just simply how we identify them as the correct group of people who are the ones who are predestined. And Paul further proves this in the next verse. Christ, whom you also trusted, past tense, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So predestination is that while all these fools are being deceived by the devil into thinking that they're going to heaven on merit, or uh, that science and creation is our salvation, or that we're all good people who sort of deserve to be saved in a roundabout way, and of course they pass that foolishness and carnal thinking onto the next generation, God chose a people to be his righteous remnant, to reveal the mystery of his will, and knowing this mystery, after we heard the word of truth, we trusted Christ, we believed, to the praise and the glory of his grace. That's why we love grace so much, and we hate works boasting. We can't stand all of these Christians who make the gospel about them. You know, I did this and I did that. As far as we're concerned, let the dogs return to their vomit. We much prefer that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's our destiny, and it's been our destiny since before the world began. He's already blessed us in heavenly places. We're simply waiting and hoping by faith. This should be a great encouragement to the saints. Amen.